me. And I didn't want to do it. This was in a computer programming language that I never used again. This was in Fortran 4. This was, all the data definitions were not documented at all. It was all in my head. And so the only person who could do anything with it was me. If I'd ever been hit by a bus, that development would have been toast. As it was, they would call me up and they said, well, we want to change this, you know, the, a different statistical reduction for that kind of data and that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to do it. I, you know, I was you know, moving on to different things in my life. Um, so I started jacking up my price. And I was working here when I got the last, the last offer and they said, hey, we're, um, you know, we, would, we would like to be able to port this over to another uh, data platform. We want you to, to do it for us. And I said, $200 an hour. And they said, okay. I mean, I said $200 an hour because I didn't think there was any way in heck that they would, but they took it. Um, and every time I did this, I had to relearn it, right? And the only person in the whole world that could make this thing work was me. I remember at one point I said, look, I don't want to do this anymore. I really don't like this. This is poorly done. I can use a modern database and a modern computing language, and I can do this in a weekend. And the guy, you know, the civil servant who was running this gave me this long-suffering look and said, look, I know you mean well. I have money in my budget for maintenance. I have no money in my budget for capital improvement. So just keep fixing it. I said, can I fix it to C++? And he says, no. It's got to be the same. Yeah, it was, it was horrible, right? It was slow. And, the, and, you know, the reason it finally went away was because it wasn't serving a need anymore. It, it outlived its usefulness. It was dependent on a, one simple programmer. The advantage to all of this, though, is that because you have the data, res, the, the data processing resident in the program itself, programmatically it runs efficiently. It runs fast. So you still see this kind of stuff, only it's very carefully used, um, like in your ABS system for your brakes. You probably don't want to have to go through a database and do a query to get, to, to get your ABS to work, right? Flight controls is another. Computer games, things where things have to be fast. But you ended up with a system like this. You know, payroll would be over here, right? Sales would be over here. Manufacturing would be over here. Um, and the only way things data transferred was something called a sneaker net. Basically, you put on your sneakers and grabbed a paper report and ran it around. And, and let me tell you, you know, part of my, my, my history was as a sales representative. I sold semiconductors around the world, and I was commission-based. Um, and that means that if I made a big sale, that's where most of my income came from. So I would come into the sales department and said, just made a big kill. I just sold you know, you know, X number of chips over three years to so-and-so company. I did, here, here's the contract. Here's, how, here's, here's it all laid out. You know, and, and, and some of those were, you know, tens of thousands of dollars just for the one contract. And so I come in, I turn to the sales department. So, you know, like most salesmen, I was living hand to mouth. So I want my money. I want my money now. I said, okay, fine. So we'll, we'll run this over to the payroll department. Well, that would take a week. And they would put it into the system and then they'd have to process it. So I probably wouldn't see it for two or three or four weeks. And then I've just sold 100,000 chips. And the folks in manufacturing don't know until someone says, oh, yeah, we probably should send them a sales report. This is a hugely inefficient way to do business. To be fair, when this kind of stuff came up, it was because computers were low powered and running payroll was all a computer could handle and, and managing the sales force was all a computer could handle and manufacturing was choking because computers weren't powerful enough. This was the individual flat file approach. And it got us off the ground. It showed us how to make this stuff work, all right? So problems with this approach are who owns the data, right? Data has to be maintained. If it isn't maintained, it loses value. I mean, think about student records, right? We're always adding grades, we're always adding uh, uh, new information and that kind of stuff. Then you guys graduate. You go out into the world and you get jobs and you move around, you get married, uh, you have kids, and we want to keep track of that. Um, it, it helps us, you know, I mean, 
Some people will be uh, facetious and say, yeah, so you can ask for donations, and that, there's some of that. But a lot of it helps us do a better job if we know that you were successful in, in what you did and where you went. Who owns that data? It's expensive to pay someone to take care of it. And then sharing data between applications. If you have this flat file approach, you probably need to write an additional program called a filter to translate it from one to another. Um, or you duplicate the data. And duplicating the data is a bad thing. Because if there's ever an error in it, um, you never get it right in all the databases. Right? That's that redundancy. And you end up with inconsistency and inflexibility. Your data is not flexible. You can't do the stuff you want to do because you don't know if you're right or not. You lose confidence in it. The term is called poor data standards or lack of data integrity. You lose data integrity, people stop believing in the data, you might as well not have a computer. All right? And excessive maintenance, you're always messing with it. And there's a huge opportunity for errors. I'm about to tell you a true story, one that happened to one of my students. Um, actually, when I was teaching IBC in that room right over there, um, young, bright young man, um, you know, uh, accounting student, and uh, you know, kind of had the world by the tail and, and did very well here. And he got his dream job. He got a job at Disney World. And it worked out really well for him. Um, because he, you know, he you know, moved down to Orlando, Florida. Well, his parents were retiring at about that time. So they moved down to Orlando, Florida. And he lived in their basement. And he still lived like a college student. So he was getting a professional grade salary and he was banking three quarters of it. He was saving it, you know, because he was a nerd and didn't have much of a social life. Um, and so fast forward three years, and I get a phone call from this guy. He said, hey, Mark, I just, you know, wanted, wanted to talk to you, let you know how things are going here at, at Disney World. Oh, it sounds great. So we chatted a little bit about that. And he goes, now, I've got $125,000 in my savings account. I was wondering if I should do something with that. And so I... I, I, I nodded and I provided the, the, the sage advice, you know, we, you know, you might want to consider real estate. I mean, it's a booming market down there right now and, you know, you'll, you'll make some money on it. You certainly want to try to invest it in something, you know, prepare for your retirement or, you know, a, a, a new home or something like that. And, you know, I, I talked about Roth IRAs and, you know, I thought I had a, a, a pretty good conversation with him about that and what he should do with it. And he said, well, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. And then he went and bought a Corvette. Not just any Corvette. This was the top of the line Corvette. It was black, it had chrome everything. It looked like it was going 100 miles an hour just sitting there on the ground, right? It was just tremendous, okay? And so he bought this thing and he drove it off the lot. Well, remember, he is in Orlando, Florida, one of the drug capitals of the world. And he drove off the lot and he's an eighth of a mile away and the sirens come on and they pull him over because also in Orlando, Florida, driving a black top-of-the-line Corvette is a, drug is a drug dealer. And, you know, armed, dangerous, nasty guy. And so they, uh, you know, they, they pull him over and these guys, you know, one in front, one in behind, they got shotguns, they're going, get out of the car, get out of the car. You know, and our mild-mannered student you know, gets out and they throw him on the ground, they have a shotgun screwed in his ear and they pat him down and they realize this is not a drug lord, this is an accountant. <laughs> and they go, we're very sorry, we're very sorry. And the guy, got, he's a little miffed, right? But he said, okay. And they said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll put this in our database, this will never happen again, we're really sorry. So that's fine. So he's had a car about a month now. And he wants to take it out on the highway, just see what it'll do, right? And so he gets out there, and, and he may have been speeding. He was. And the highway patrol comes on, uh, lights come on, and they pull him, and they do the same thing, you know, and they pull him out, and they again realize, no, what we have is a, an accountant with delusions of grandeur. And a, you know, now he's getting a little, little upset because he said, they told me that when this happened the last time that they would uh, put it in the database, this wouldn't happen. They, they'd run my license plate number, and it wouldn't be an issue. And they said, we'll take care of it, we'll take care of it, okay? And he agreed with them. Fast forward this, another six months, and he's, he's working away in his office, and, and he gets an email 
from his long lost college love, the young lady that dumped him in his senior year. Um, and he said, you know, I made some mistakes in my life and I think that ending our relationship was one of the dumbest things I ever did. And if you could see your way clear to um, starting a conversation with me, starting something up, I, I would really like that. And his response was, sure. <laughs> Um, and so they carried on a conversation and she was going to come down and visit him and his parents and you know it's pretty serious and so he's got the world plan he's got he's got this planned out right he's you know there she's flying into Miami because it's it, the, the flight flights were cheaper gonna meet him in the Corvette right and they're gonna go there's a little place down the beach um, they're gonna have dinner right violins everything right so he he shows up and picks her up, you know, well, you know, man of the world now, I've got this Corvette. And driving down the, yeah, you can catch, guess, guess what's going to happen next, right? Driving down the freeway and they pull him over, uh, Dade County Sheriff, um, throw him on the ground and throw the young lady on the ground and they've got guns out and they realize that they have messed up in a big way and there was a lawsuit and, and, uh, all of it could have been avoided if they had had some way to transfer information between the databases that was seamless, right? They had one database. Okay. Oh, someone normally asks about this point, um, but what happened to the couple? They have a nice house, two kids, and a minivan. <laughs> um, but excessive maintenance, all right? So here's the database approach. The focus is on the data, not on the application. We focus on how to build a storage path for that information. The applications and the programs change constantly. There's a churn, but the data definitions and the data remains constant. The data is centralized, right? One location. So you don't have three different law enforcement agencies struggling over uh, what the data is. You have corporate-wide data, data naming standards. You're not using A, B, C, D like I did in the program from hell. You're using names that make sense. Corporate in, in interest rate. Customer name, right? Names that make sense so you can kind of puzzle out what's going on. And it's planned to meet organizational objectives. You think about what are we going to need data for and how are we going to use this, right? Data integrity is better. Why? Because it's in one location and you can manage it, you can correct it, um, and you can secure it. There's a huge reduction in redundancy, and if you reduce redundancy, you increase your flexibility. You can, you can, you know, you find an error, you can go in one place and fix it, and it's right in all those locations. You can extract information and know everything about your customer base. <clears throat> and, and it kind of looks like this, right? We've got our database. We have various application programs that are going into that data and picking out the pieces they need, right? Maybe over here we've got the sales folks and uh, they're putting in their sales figures and they're putting in information about the customers and, and they're extracting information about the customers. What, you, know, you know, dumb things matter when you're dealing with customers, right? You want to know what their birthdays are and things like that. Um, over here we've got accounting and they're keeping track of... Uh, what's being bought, what's being sold, how much to pay commission to that salesman um, who's already overspent. Um, and what it means is these things run a lot faster and they can be specific. Whereas um, the data is general. Advantages to a database system, right? Um, we have program independence. You can change the program, the front end, without messing with the data. You're not going to damage your data, which is huge. Your data integrity is, 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 is improved. It's more accurate, it's more timely, and you can deal with the trouble of concurrency. concurrency con boom. We'll try again. Concurrency is a, is a problem when you have multiple people using the same data. Let's say we have Bob and Mary, and they're working on a uh, joint project here at the university. Bob has a, a job in the uh, athletic cage where he hands out towels, but he's, more, he's working, you know. Most of the time he hands out towels, but he's working on a project. And he's going great guns, 
and he's doing well. Mary um, is going to class and she has a brilliant idea about their project. So she goes and she downloads the data, she makes a change to the data and saves it back on the data. Meanwhile, Bob is still in the, in the athletic cage and he's still working on his program. Gets to the end of the day, time for him to quit, so he saves his work and he saves it over Mary's work. That's the problem when you have multiple people using the same data. Modern databases manage that concurrency. They'll lock you out of records so that if one person is working on a record, the other person can't. Um, and that's a huge performance enhancing device. You know, you don't waste so many steps. The speed of development is much faster because a lot of the things you're doing with the data, like writing a report, you do that outside the database. You're not manipulating the data. You're using a tool outside that, input forms. And then when you do go and manipulate the data, you do it just once. We have the flexibility to do ad hoc queries. Ad hoc queries are a very, very powerful tool in the business.